Um, Scott. Hi. Hold on. I'm trying to beef me up here. Sure. There. How's that? It's great. So great to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. You got your Kirby shirt on. You're sporting the the, the colors. <laughs> yeah. Well, I figured I got I got a lot of this stuff, so why not? Right on. It is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this office of yours, man. It's a library. Well, yeah, it's a fraction of what I'd like to have in here. I've got a lot of stuff in storage, but. Oh, I was going to say, maybe you just need to pan back and you'd be about this big on the screen so we could see your whole collection, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid there's a lot of stuff I'll never see again. Hmm. Yeah, well, I, I just started immediately recording uh, so I, I want to give you a heads up to watch what you're saying. <laughs> well, I certainly didn't want you to put that drawing up that I did. You know, it, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, so so everybody who's listening right right before Scott and I uh, got got on the camera here, Scott sent me uh, an image you drew in 1970. And I was thinking of this very image because you had shared it with me some time ago and, and oh, I didn't know that <laughs> about it and I I actually have the poster here I, I I grabbed some materials and I I have that actual poster and I I wanted to ask if if I censored the image if if you would be comfortable sharing it or not so that's, that's fine yeah I, okay so they that that book about the history of comic con they used the original thing of course it was fanographic so <laughs> your publisher you know what <laughs> they have to do. I have I have some questions about the input of fanographics about your book. Too. Sure, sure. Well, well, uh, this is great. Let let let's jump in and and get started. Uh, tell tell everybody, who are you and uh, what are you known for? I'm a crazy old man now, <laughs> but once I was hip and cool, fifty years ago. Uh, <laughs> Now I'm just corny, like, like <laughs> really, I don't know. But um, I've been, I've been. Uh, my name's Scott Shaw. I've been drawing and writing comic books and animated cartoons and TV commercials and underground comics and all kinds of stuff for a long time, a long time. In fact, if you want to read more about me, I have a new book myself. Oh, good. Yeah, we both have them. That's right. We 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 made a trade. So. This will kind of show a lot of the stuff I own the rights to, but um, I've been I've been uh, you know fortunate to have uh, my own comic with, I created with Roy Thomas, Captain Carrot, and his amazing Zoo Crew, which uh, DC has no idea what to do with. They think it's serious and macho, and it's like I I I, I just don't understand their thinking. However, basically they, they have a new Captain Carrot. Uh, you know figure coming out not looking like my character but some grotesque version of it i'll still make some money at but i'm i'm already wincing at having to sign it for people at conventions acting like i think it looks good because it's just horrifying to me i i heard yeah. that uh your captain carrot was was a big influence on alan moore and frank miller doing watchmen and uh batman you know take taking comics in that dark direction dark and realistic yeah yeah well let's do that with donald duck you know i mean they, they the concept of humor eludes most people in comics now and there's so few funny things out there if it's funny it's also got lots of dead bodies laying around and uh my work was never intentionally for kids it was just for people that like silly stuff like me but even now in children's graphic novels which is something i want to get into it's all got to be a big message and i understand that with the way society is going and and uh you know kids need to be encouraged in all the important things but but they still have captain underpants and they don't want anybody else doing something like that captain underpants which is just fun and silly which is what i'd like to do or dr seuss you can't you can't do dr seuss because he he you know 50 years ago he put something in that people don't like now well you know it's you're not going to burn Dr. Seuss books. I'm sorry, but it, it's a different era, and um, I'm willing to go along with it. But uh, 
I certainly can't write from a, the point of view of a little girl who likes other girls, you know, that sort of thing. I just don't have the, I don't even know how to write for a little girl. You know, I don't have any sisters. I don't have any, any daughters. So, you know, a lot of that stuff seems phony to me because people are trying to go out with a big message and don't quite understand what they're doing other than their editor told them to make a big message. Comics, uh, it, it's really interesting, the industry, how uh, comics are for kids again. You know, there, there were a lot of years us, us trying to break, break free from that. And now, now the best-selling comics are young adult comics, you know, and they're, they're out performing uh, superheroes and everything else at this point. Yeah, in fact, I noticed that both DC and Marvel have, you know, like uh, chapter books now and, and ver with very few illustrations and not even necessarily referring to them as superheroes. And they, they've got a lot of books that are uh, the superheroes as kids you know, and, and stuff like that, too. So, yeah, but fortunately, there's lots of them that aren't run by created by giant corporations. And those are the ones that tend to be more real, in my opinion. Scott, tell me about uh, how, how you met and came to be friends with Jack Kirby. Well, that's an interesting story. I was one of the kids that helped start San Diego Comic Con. Uh, long before 1970, probably more like 68 was when we started talking about it. And um, uh, we wound up being invited to go to Jack Kirby's house. He was living in Thousand Oaks, which was uh, a little bit north of L.A., certainly still in L.A. County. And we were all from San Diego. So some of the group had already met him. I hadn't. Um, and about a dozen of us went up there. And uh, Jack was incredibly kind and patient with some of the ridiculous stuff people were asking him. And one of the guy's mothers had to bring him up and she was looking through their closets in the back room. And we wouldn't we wouldn't leave. I mean, at least Shel Dorf didn't want us to leave. And finally, Roz had to go out and get get burgers for us and stuff. And Roz, Jack Roz looking more. Wife. Jack's looking more and more worried about, you know, I, he didn't say anything, but I could see on his face. It's like he needs to get to work and we're still there at three in the afternoon. And, you know, I was, I don't know, 17. And even I realized we're blowing it. We're, Jack invited to his our, his house and, he, and, and we won't leave him alone. But um, at one point we were kind of all face to face and, uh, a little more backstory. I I really love Jack's work, but it wasn't until I saw the first issue of Not Brand Act that he could do really funny stuff as well. I wasn't aware of Fighting American and and uh, you know the Alligator, the the original Lockjaw, and all the all the humor stuff he'd done in the past. But it completely blew my mind because I always assumed, well, if you draw superheroes, then you draw that style. Well, he, even his funny animal stuff still looked like Jack Kirby. But that's when I realized, and I told him, I said, you're my favorite cartoonist. And, you know, at the time, everybody was saying, oh, you're like the new Da Vinci and, you know, all this crap. And I thought, no, you're a cartoonist. And he got a big smile on his face. I didn't know it, but he always called himself a cartoonist. Because the really, the term cartoonist has changed. Everybody thinks, oh, it's all funny stuff. And that's what I was alluding to as a kid. But really, it's for people who write and draw their own material, do both. That's what real cartoonists feel about other cartoonists. And Jack certainly was that. And I never really appreciate as much as in, now that he's not around. But when you read his, his uh, dialogue, especially, whether it's humor or straight stuff, people would complain, oh, this doesn't sound like like the way the characters are supposed to talk. Everything, when you read it, I hear it in Jack's voice, and it's exactly how Jack spoke, which I think is a great memory for those of us that knew him, because you read one of those new gods, and you go, the thing where he said, it'll rattle his gonads, I remember was something he put in one of the things. But yeah, that's that's the sort of thing Jack would say to be funny, you know? So he, he had a great sense of humor, and 
my favorite photos of him are those uh photos of the kids with the Hanukkah gifts and he's like acting he's acting like Alan King like oh one of them somebody's hanging up holding up folk music he's like oh like he's really acting nutty and I thought that's the, that's what I always knew was kind of in Jack and I think the fact that I got away with so many things like the poster we were talking about and other things I think he liked me and a lot of us because we reminded him of what he was like when he was our age. In fact, a lot of people through Comic Con, I had that same experience. Ray Bradbury was the same way. It was like, and I understand cause now because when I see kids, I like to encourage them. And it's like, yeah, I remember what it was like back then, too. So knowing Jack was a great gift, great gift. I, I like what you say about how you can hear his voice. And it, it makes me think of um, Quentin Tarantino films. You know, uh, I, I was in college when those were first coming out. And, you know, I watched the first one and the second one. I thought, oh, these are great. And then, you know, he started showing up on uh, interview shows everywhere. And, and then I would go back to the original show uh, movies and realize that everything sounded like him talking, every character. And, and then Jackie Brown came out and that was adapted from a book. And that, that was the first one I went, well, this one doesn't sound like him. Uh, but but it, it is interesting to, to think of how, you know, this, this is his art. It, it's him expressing himself. It's his voice coming out in his comics. And in, in this case, literally, it's his voice coming out. I, I think that's really interesting. And I, I think that's lovely that you can read an old comic and hear him in it well it's just and frankly it's you know a lot of people are like why doesn't this sound the way when stan lee was writing the dialogue they thought stan was also doing the story too so that shows how little they knew but it's like absolutely and you you notice it because it sounds like stan lee and stan's persona not only on pa paper but in personality you know, my favorite movie, and I think a lot of guys my age, it's kind of like our Star Wars, was the 1933 King Kong when it came on TV when we were kids. You ever notice how much Stan's uh, public persona resembles the guy that captures Kong? <laughs> I'll have to go whenever, and watch I watch that. the movie whenever it's on, and the first thing that comes to me is that Stan who thinks he's got the monster under control and the monster is Jack. <laughs> I love it. Do you remember when we first met Scott? I know you meet a lot of people at those comic con tables. I just remember that you were one of the first guys that one that, that, that liked all the, uh, the, what they used to call pre hero monsters. Do you, do you remember if you met me first or had stumbled onto my work first? You know, after all these years and all that THC, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm i pretty sure our first face-to-face -face meeting was at a WonderCon before it moved down to Los Angeles. I, I'm pretty sure it was a WonderCon, like maybe in Oakland or San Francisco. And... Um, my my memory of it but but this was you know 20 years ago is um i i had been publishing comics for maybe a year or two and um i think at that point i i had recently released this which which was my you know giant monsters um and someone came to my table and said hey have you met scott shaw and he, he either said he showed me your book or he said, you should show him your book. And I can't remember which. And at, at that point, I went over and spoke with you and you, you immediately made me feel like we were best friends. And, uh, you know, well, you think everybody's your best friend. <laughs> so I, I wanted to share this because Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because your names are the funniest things ever. <laughs> Pika Pika. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, 
of yeah. Mount Rushmore. Yeah, you just see a little bit of him up there. Yeah. When whenever I see you, I feel like you say, you know who my favorite monster is, Chris? It's Pika Pika, Peeping Tom of Mount Rushmore. And um I, I just spoke with John Morrow on, on a Zoom interview. And right before I hit record, he said, hey, I wanted to tell you, I was flipping through your book before we got online here. And my favorite is Pika Pika. <laughs> so something about Pika Pika speaks to you Kirby fans. <laughs> you know, even when those books were coming out, I thought it was kind of like, you know, the Kaiju characters and, and you know, you know, 15 minutes in after we realize there's a monster loose, they immediately have a name for it. And it's like, what is there a committee that comes up with monster names? Do they have meetings every six months or something? And I always thought, I just didn't really know the process of comics very much. But I thought, what do they do? Do they all just get drunk and, and just come up, you know, make farts and stuff to come up with names? You know, it was just so hilarious. And yet... Um, the first comic I ever saw by Jack Kirby was uh, Tales of Suspense number 11 was Spore, the thing that would not die. And I pointed at it. I was a kid. My mom was very, you know, they let me read comics from a very early age. Like from my, when I was two years old, I wanted comics. That's how I taught myself how to read before kindergarten. But if mom, I got to have this comic. And she's like, no, you're not. That's going to give you nightmares. It's like, yeah, I like I like monsters. I don't mind nightmares at all. And no, no, but but here's Space Mouse. I think you'd like Space Mouse. And it was like, yeah, I, that's a that's an interesting idea. But I want this comic. Well, I wound up taking home Space Mouse. Um, I don't know how many years it was. Forty years later. Uh, <laughs> My, at Comic Con, my my birthday was a few months after that. My mom would always, after my dad passed, she she'd give me like a hundred dollars. Say, here, buy yourself something nice at Comic Con. So that year, that's a loving, understanding mom. Well, one time, one time I asked her, you know, when she before when she was getting older, but not not uh, terribly. I said, did you know that when when you were giving me comics that there were a book about how comics would turn your kid into a juvenile delinquent and how people were burning comics. And she, she did this. She goes, well, all I know is you really needed them. It was like, it was like, I, apparently I was so, you know, overwhelming that it didn't matter whether it would turn me into a juvenile delinquent or not. Of course, in our generation, we all became hippies. So that's kind of the same thing. But anyway, um, so I, I I call her. Actually, I went over to the house and I said, uh, "Hey, mom, you want to see what I got?" And she goes, "Yeah." So I spent a hundred dollars on it. I every cent. She goes, "Yeah, really? What is it?" So, Tells us suspense number eleven. And I said, "You know, mom, if you just let me buy this for a dime, you, <laughs> I could I could have had it spent this." And by the way, the guy that drew this, your grandson is named after him. <laughs> I mean, it was a. I wasn't. I wasn't being mean to my mom, but I just thought the irony of that it never went away. That you know, it's like I was an only kid. I was never denied a lot. So stuff like that. I was very spoiled, obviously. But uh, you know, when I wasn't allowed to have something that that would have made a big, you know, impression on me. I think the first comic I was allowed to read was that uh, Secret Origins that had a chapter from the first uh, Challenges of the Unknown story. Sure. But not enough that you knew what was going on. It was just one chapter. It was like, well, where's the whole story? Well, this shows their origin. That's all you need. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how these early comics, because because you mentioned, what what was it, Space Mouse? Um, yeah. And and so what what attracted you was, was the Kirby horror comics and clearly made an impression on you and what you went home with was sort of the funny animal comic right and which i wound up the, working on too yeah, yeah so look, look at the path that these led you down right well i'll tell you something when i was a kid 
This is my secret origin for liking giant monsters. For many years, I, I, I was born in New York City, and we didn't move to San Diego until I was about two and a half. And for years, every month at least, I would have a weird dream about being in a big room with a whale hanging over my head. And I'm like, why am I having that dream? I went back to see to, for a meeting with DC in New York City. I definitely went, I love dinosaurs and museums. And I almost fell down. I was so shocked because they are, by this time, it was a plastic version, not a taxidermy version of a blue whale hanging over my head. But that I realized that's why I have always been fascinated by dinosaurs, uh, mythical characters like Paul Bunyan. Um, I've always loved in King Kong, Godzilla, all that stuff. And I never realized that's what kicked it off. You, you, you were taken to one of these museums as a kid. And it, it it seeped into your psyche. Even I was still in a stroller. My, I asked my mom. She goes, oh, yeah, we took you there. I said, "Was how were you? Oh, oh, you were in a stroller. Well, of course, seeing something that surreal just burned itself into my brain. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I, I, I have that. an explanation. It, was, it wasn't just me being weird. The knowledge forced itself upon me, you know. <laughs> yeah. One of the first things I remember you saying that really had an impression on me, and I, I'm pretty sure is that first time we met, you, you were talking about Marvel Comics and DC Comics. And you said DC Comics often felt kind of like those old kaiju films where, you know, they, they were clean and uh, proper and the, the art was just so and the colors were just so. And then you said Marvel, on the other hand, it, it felt more like that... Uh, you know, the John Landis teen werewolf and and those kind of movies. I'm going blank on what company that is. Do you, do you remember? Well, well, it, it like was that? American International. Yes. yes. And uh, uh, one of the runners of that thing, I can't remember his name, but he mainly came well did a lot of things. But one of his jobs was to come up with names that would sell. And then it was kind of like the old pulp magazines. We have a cover, come up with a story to match. Same thing with Julie Schwartz, who was an ed, uh, uh, an agent back then. A lot of people at DC wanted a cover first, which I think was much smarter. Have this out, figure out something that, you know, sets a question. How did this happen? What? Why are they there? And then you have to buy the comic to read to read it. And uh, uh, DC, on the other hand, it was just like, well, we're finally doing superheroes again. And uh, I wasn't there, obviously, but I think Stan probably thought, I've got Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby. I'm going to let them do whatever the hell they want to do because because they know they really know how to get attention. Yeah, or their work does, I should say. So, I mean, you know, they. I, I remember I had the first issue of Spider-Man. A neighbor kid gave it to me. And even though I like Steve Ditko's art, I like I already collected Congo, Conga, and and Gorgo comics, the Charlton ones. Um, Monsters. Well, and I really love the Gorgo movie too. That's that for a kid my age, that's like the best ending ever in a dinosaur movie. They destroy London and then walk away. They win. I mean, it's like yeah, finally the good guys win. But uh, you know the. Uh, the whole thing with Marvel just felt more exciting because even though the covers were ghastly, I mean, the drawings were fine, but they were colored so poorly. It was all grays and browns on the backgrounds. It was like, can you kind of amp it up to kind of <laughs> get kids' attention? No, we can't, we can't afford color. No. <laughs> and also that the, uh, the, the, the paper was so crummy. Even on the covers, there was no... It, the ink would come off on your hands if you were holding, if you're sweating or something. It wasn't, it didn't have that shiny uh, thing added like DC stuff did. But anyway, I had that first Spider-Man comic and I was probably 12, you know, you, on a Sunday when you're 12, back then you couldn't do anything. A lot of the stores were, you know, I couldn't take the bus to the, the zoo or something. I was so bored. I used an X-Acto knife and cut the whole comic apart. Because somehow I felt it's like 
DC Comics that, and 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 Dell and all the others they they look really nice. This looked like it had been printed in somebody's basement. And and I just didn't take it seriously. And that's so mind-blowing because, you know, I do like Dipco stuff, but it's the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I remember I first I started just cutting around the, the, the word balloons. No, no, then I'll cut around the figure. I mean, when you're a when you're a bored pre teenager, what else are you gonna do? Well, I know what else you're gonna do, but we can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're gonna get to that in a minute. Uh, you know what we skipped is how uh, you are a character in Kirby's comics. Well, a lot of us are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> well. But Jack was very nice about it. That same day that I was talking about, um, he was talking about how he could draw just about anything. Not bragging, but just kind of like saying, you know, if you're going to be a cartoonist, you have to know how to draw everything. And, I, and he said, I could even draw you. And we all went, okay, Jack. And I could see this just like a flash, like, what have I just done? <laughs> but he came right, okay, guys. And... uh uh, you, know, you know, of course, we were all writhing, not not understanding how how many months ahead Jack was on things. But it must have been maybe five months later. We all come out in uh, the Jimmy Olsen series, which quite honestly, with all the fourth world and all the cosmic stuff he did for DC, that's my favorite Kirby series from DC because it's not because we're in it because it's humor. He's being funny. He's getting, he's, he's, his, his sense of humor really comes through in that book. And uh, so that's one reason I really, really dig it. But uh, you know, we were in two issues. Obviously he got rid of us as fast as possible. Uh, but we did have a nice splash page and uh one of us, Barry Alfonso, who's a uh, noted author, was not only added, he was Barry Boy. It was the five-string mob. And of course, with Kirby, there were six of us. <laughs> he kind of had him at the end, like, like, oh, I forgot. I better put him in. <laughs> and, I, and, I'm, and I have no doubt that probably what happened. <laughs> but, but he uh, also used Barry as a basis for Witch Boy in, uh, in The Demon. So, yeah. you know... He uh he really liked us. Yeah, that's great. Um, so you you were raised with these kind of funny comics and a lot of Kirby, uh, but you started making indie comics with an X, right? When when you started making comics, were underground you know, comics. Yeah, that, that was my first the first paying gig was in seventy two, and I worked on a something with a big monster called the Turd. And uh. How how was it coming from these uh, inspirations that you wound up in that camp? Well, the main inspiration, I think, was the fact that my other favorite cartoonist was on the opposite end of the spectrum from Jack, was Gilbert Shelton, the guy that created the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. But before then, he'd been doing Wonder Warthog since the early 60s. And I hadn't seen any of those because they were mainly in college magazines. But then he started putting Wonder Warthog in Help magazine. Harvey Kurtzman was hiring him. And then he was in uh, Drag Cartoons, which was kind of a rival to cartoons with all automotive gags and black and white magazine. And Wonder Warthog just blew my mind and was my favorite. So, you know, when I, when, when, I think in 68, I bought my first underground comic, and it was one of the earliest ones by Gilbert Shelton, Feds and Heads. And it was just like, if he's going this direction, that's what I want to do, too. And, you know, it's that was what I was doing. I still do stuff like that once in a while. My new story that's online has a lot of F words and stuff in it. But uh, it's, it's, it's not intentionally... Uh, outrageous as much as it's about home care nursing. 
and a lot of the stuff I've been through after I hmm. lost my foot. So By the way, let me show it off. Yeah. So let me show off my foot because talk about monsters. This is another big influence on me. <laughs> Rat Fink. Rat Fink is the greatest. Big Daddy Roth and Dr. Seuss were the first two heroes before before Jack Kirby. Ah, okay. Yeah. And that has that, I mean, I was I, I learned how to draw like Dr. Seuss when I was probably six years old. I mean, my own version, but you could tell what it looked like. Yeah. And Big Daddy Roth, again, a guy kind of an underground type character. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I really think that in my case, becoming a hippie was kind of, you know, just the natural thing for me. I remember the first live movie I saw was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and I was on Captain Nemo's side. I thought, he doesn't, he does, he wants to stop war. Well, why are they trying to get after him? He's the good guy. <laughs> that guy singing in the seals, an idiot. <laughs> and then the outer limits coming after right after Kennedy's assassination, and the early episodes, the outer limits were all about how the government was controlling all of us. All, the, all these influences I, are are directing your your path. Yeah, I yeah. I, I mean, my 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 career has a very definite kind of. I mean, there's definitely been, you know, dips and and high points, but it's been pretty much that way. I was very lucky. I, I think now if you had to get into comics, it'd be like crawling over broken glass. But doing humor, everybody else my age wanted to draw superheroes. Doing humor, I think, really worked in my favor yeah yeah so I, I was starting to open up the book here is from your book the turd <laughs> and uh i i think you told me that uh this was influenced on a hulk issue by herb trimpey is that right uh, yeah it's the one where he fights the glob yeah and he knocks the glob they're like on the top of a tower and, and at the the last three panels it looks like dog turds crawling around the way <laughs> And, and 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 this isn't a put down because I always loved her uh, loved Herb's cartooning. Most people don't realize that he was imitating Jack because he was at Marvel. But he, in an interview, many interviews actually said his big inspiration was Jack Davis. Mm. And when you know that, suddenly it makes a lot of sense when you're looking at his art. This is Jack Davis trying to imitate Jack Kirby. <laughs> You know, now comics aren't drawn in cartoony styles. You know, we grew up, my favorites was was Kirby, um, Ramona Fraden, um, Ditko, uh, uh, Ross Andrew, all people that had appealing cartoony kind of styles. You weren't expected to think they were real. Now everybody is using accurate anatomy, except for Rob Liefeld. And... Uh, He's still out there for some strange reason. Everybody feels sorry for him. Can't sell those jeans anymore. But he, um, he made his money. I, he I made his money. I remember at Comic Con one time he threw out free, free uh, T-shirts and almost caused a riot. I thought this guy doesn't have much judgment in anything, does he? But um, yeah, it's. Uh, it, 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 I, I, I like what I like. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of it around. Yeah. I'm going to share one other thing that you might not even remember doing for me. This was a convention sketch. I, if I do it at a convention, I don't remember it at all. You know, you know what it's like now. You're behind a table and everybody's coming by and you're trying to be on and friendly, but you're also thinking, God, I got to use the bathroom. I mean, how do you? It's, it's it's very hard for me to remember a whole lot that's happened at Comic Con. No problem. Of course, yeah. Of course, I've been at every one of them since when, the year I lost my foot. So it's kind of uh, all melded together. Yeah. Scott, I'm on the cheap plan for Zoom, and we're just about to run out of time here. Would you be up for logging back on and us talking a little more? Or if you have, yeah, I'd like to talk a little more about your book. We okay. never got around to that. Sorry. Great, and and I would love to share with everybody your uh, deranged tale tribute to uh, the King Jack Kirby. So let let's log off and come on, and we'll do those things.
I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> All right, bye. <laughs>